All right, welcome, small but esteemed audience. Highly esteemed. I gotta wait for Jacoby to come back. Um, there's actually some fun things to hit related to this. I know I started this a little bit um, before, like on the study day or something for the exam, and I realized, yeah, it's not gonna happen. So I decided not to finish up the web stuff before the previous exam. And uh, so I said a few things about this before. So like what was supposed to be on the exam, it's not gonna be on the exam. And then just my own whole little philosophical rant on like, I can't believe that somebody who's working as a contractor uh, at an atom collider organization ha is just given, you know, free reign to like, just go make up some pet project and like, hey, I'm gonna build this thing that's never been done before. It's called a web server. And like, you know, I don't know, why don't I ever get those kind of jobs? Like, <laughs> it's like, go do whatever you want all the time. Um, so anyway, that was cool that he, that he, built this, but something that kind of strikes me is that this just, you know, web server is just technology that sits on top of the internet infrastructure. It's just some, it's just a service that runs on a port at an IP address. So they just made it up. Before then, we already had mail services and things like that that were already running on ports. And at that time, with related to the internet, all these programs that would talk back and forth to one another, uh, you, you would use the equivalent of like your little shell windows, just like logging into some terminal and sending some commands and um, you know, a message would go to the appropriate program. So the, a web server is just another version of those that we've created up with uh, web browsers. And I'll show you some examples of that a little bit. Um, so with, with his web server, he built the web server. He also built HTTP. So he built several things at once. Uh, HTTP being the, the rules that we use for sending information back and forth at one of these higher levels. Uh, that I would consider web stuff to be a layer seven, an application that runs there. Um, and, and you guys do a lot with it, uh, especially from the beginning as we think about like layers, layers, uh, you know, programs that are running on the internet, pretty much everything is just like a text message that gets sent back and forth between two programs. So ignore the, like everything else we've done with the seven layers of the OSI and just think, okay, if, if none of that data communication existed um, and if a computer could assume that there's a, like a, a sender and a receiver on the exact same computer and it didn't have to go across a wire, uh, a lot of this stuff, these protocols, are, assume that that hey we're just able to talk to one another and what's the message we would send back and forth from a client to a receiver and how would we communicate to, to do something of, of use. Um, and so a lot of these protocols such as HTTP are originally just plain text messages and if we get to it today I'll even show you some stuff with email where it works the exact same way. You can just use it. So we can um, do HTTP stuff, uh, command line as well as email. All right. So. Let's, uh, this won't show up on the video, but uh, I'm going to have you guys role play. <laughs> so, all right, so over here, happy to be, here's your web server, uh, and we need a web browser, how's the Jacoby web browser? I've got I've got more roles, so just, just you wait. So here's some pieces of paper. There it is, there's the piece of paper that he had. Yeah. So go ahead 
And from your, this is the text that gets sent from your, your web browser when you type something into the URL and hit return. Um, this is the message. And so let's go ahead and send your message, uh, uh, hand it to the routers. The routers will handle uh, taking that as a packet of information. The server will look at this information and say, oh, I know, I can give you back that page, and we'll call, it'll be file.html. So go ahead and send them back a message. All right, you got your response. And your response looks like this. And the thing that I wanted to emphasize initially is just like the, the request and the response, at least from like a header-like perspective, uh, we usually don't see that. Like have you guys in your programming doing any of your C Sharp or Node or Python, have you guys ever been dealing directly with these things? Okay, so, so that happens and it gets transferred every single time. And you can, of course, manipulate this stuff. All right, but there's kind of more, we can add some more to the story though. So, we'll do a round two here. All right, so we'll have an operating system. Some frogs represent each of the cells, so we will. No, there's something fun at the dollar store. <laughs>
okay, now I've got a message, now I can hand it over to the to the, um, to the to the web server. Okay, how about uh, we have a DNS server over here, and then we're gonna do, do more with your domain here. So, I don't know if we've got enough people, but uh, <laughs> okay, I'm going to, I'm gonna revoke your status as a, a router, but I can give you, I can make you either a database or a code interpreter. Okay. All right, he's your code interpreter. Yeah. Okay, so, all right, so let's, let's try this. All right, so let's try this again. And uh, technically I've got, you know, I've got an operating system, the web browser is sitting behind. I, I could complicate it even further, but. Uh, so that was the original days of stuff that we had. It, it, the original days of stuff, like with our initial uh, web servers, there was no, there were no programming languages that were serving up pages and stuff like that. It was just static pages. Uh, basically the internet was just a bunch of poster boards where you go to some page and hey look, it's a pretty picture with some text in it. Um, but as, as you guys have all been programming stuff, you know that pages are oftentimes dynamically created now. So let's uh, let's pretend that we're getting a dynamic page. So, so you send out his request through the operating system, the router then passes it to <laughs> the router comes over, passes it to the operating system. Operating system uh, then takes that request for something dynamic, and it's going to pass it over to the web server. Web server then, nope. <laughs> yeah, the web server is going to then because it's going to notice that this is a dynamically created page authorized to then uh, request instead of from the, uh, the file service on the computer, it's going to request it from the code interpreter. <laughs> the code interpreter, you're not going to create a dynamic page. So you're going to talk to, you're going to pull some elements from whatever folder you're authorized to talk to. You're also going to pull some elements from the database. Okay, you put those things together into that, or the response. So yes, your programming language will have created a response from, from those things, just a physical um, document to send back historically for JavaScript and making it all complicated. <laughs> so in the olden days, you just were trying to create a web page that was comparable to that. So now it is completed, and uh, with this being completed, the operate, well, okay, it goes, it goes back. Now you have a completed page, so you can send it across the wire. So go to the operating system, operating system hands it to the router, and router brings it back to you. All right, so, all right, that's it with the frogs for today, uh, for now, but save them for later. And the DNS server doesn't say Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot, <laughs> I forgot about the DNS server. <laughs> it wasn't on purpose, yes, uh, in the initial request. So how would that work? So he, wa he wants to make a request from someplace he's never been to before, um, cool fuzzy llama bear shoes dot com. Uh, so what's going to happen? Set up the web <laughs> <laughs> so, so what's going to happen from the operating system perspective? It doesn't know where to go. It's right. stuck in the middle of it. So what happens? It asks the DNS server instead yes. of being the domain name. Yes, it's going to query the DNS server and what port is it going to query it on? Yeah, so it, whatever your IP address is, it's going to reach out to your IP address, port 53, UDP packets, and it's going to say, hey, where is HarryLongShoes.com or whatever it is. <laughs> You're going to get back an IP address. It's going to be the IP address of the web server slash operating system, which is just consider them collectively. Uh, whatever, whatever the computer server's IP address is, that's what you're going to get back. Now you're going to send that request to them. Or, well, it's the, that's the response, but you're going to get the request so you can send it. So. Yep, thank you for the reminder about the DNS. You guys have your Raspberry Pis up and going? Okay. So here's something 
that you can do that will allow you to kind of see how this works under the covers. So you could type in sudo apt-get install uh, telnet. Uh, so it used to, telnet is the equivalent of SSH as I see it. It's just, in the early days of computers, we always, it, it was exactly the same. It's just like the, the cool little hacker windows, right? Command line windows. Um, but Telnet as a program always sent everything in plain text. And for a long time that was okay until we decided, oh, it's not good to send all of our usernames and passwords and everything we will ever say and do uh, across the internet in plain text. So, so we stopped using Telnet, but it functionally is, is comparable. You just send messages into the black box. So I'm gonna open up <coughs> my Raspberry Pi. Are these the same instructions that the homework puzzles just followed, or? No. Oh. That'd be handy if it was. This is just, a, this is actually just to see what it's like if you're not using a web browser. So you see how it really works. So does anybody need more time to jump into their Pi and run that command? Has it finished if you have tried to run that command? Remember the last time the sudo apt-get install Okay, if you don't need any more time, then when we get to the next page, we're going to show an example of browsing the internet in the same way that any other original baseline program running on the internet uh, well, I'm saying the internet, but browsing the web technically is what I should be saying. We're, we're hitting a web server using a text-based program and seeing how underneath the covers everything is just text being passed back and forth. So I've already installed Telnet on there, so I'm just going to follow these commands. So I'm going to open this up. <coughs> Alright, so so I'm, I'm visiting this site because it's relatively small um, in terms of what's on it and uncomplicated. I guess I could also try that Kettle's Donuts one. Let's try that one. See what happens. Kettle's Donuts. Kettle'sDonuts.com port 80. So visit this page on port 80. So what I'm saying is I want to talk directly to port 80 is what I'm saying with this command. So, so I'm telling my, my program Determine this I, whatever the IP address is for this, and let's talk to it on port 80, and let's just see what happens. So we hit return, and now I'm gonna okay. Now I'm gonna say get forward slash. So show me um, whatever's in the root of the web server, like your default uh, page. Host kettlesdonuts.com. I'm not sure why we put the host thing in there, but I am aware that under uh, web servers such as Apache, that we can have at the same IP address tons of different domain names. You can have unlimited domain names sitting on the same thing, all pointing all at the same IP address. So, oopsie daisies. It looks like it just default gave me an answer there, which, but that's fine. Oh, it says timeout. <laughs> I waited too long. All right, so let me do that again. So Telnet, on port 80, and then I'll do again, get HTTP 1.1, host, bacon, oops, not that one, kettlesdonuts.com, and then I'm gonna hit return twice, so that's carriage return, and so we, we got to see the response from the server. So the response from the server is, uh, HTTP 11 200 OK. I got this response header back, which tells me all kinds of information, interesting information. And this is the part that we're used to seeing. We're like, oh yeah, we just hit view source in a browser and this is what we see. But we're actually getting more information than that. Uh, and if I look at this, like what is some of the extra information that is being passed back to me? And this will be a little bit easier to see on some slides but uh, later on, but notice that it told my browser, or even just my command line browser, uh, that 
it, what version of a web server and what type it's running. It also tells me what operating system it's running. So I just found out stuff <laughs> about a web server by visiting it um, this way. And in its response, it can, uh, it told me that it's sending me text slash HTML, it can send me other stuff. Um, if I go, well, okay. So we'll see other stuff through web browsers, which will be a little bit more detailed. So anyway, any questions about that so far? You can send a request from the command line. And that's all your browser does in a, well, originally all your browser did was just wrap up that request we did, just did from the command line that you could issue with any programming language. It just takes, sends out the request, gets it back, and then puts it in a pretty picture for you with a nice frame, nice border. You know, minimize window, all that stuff. All, but that's all it's doing. It's just writing some code that does that in the background. Yeah. So it would only grab like the front page when the main page on the website. Would you have to put like a longer URL in the request, or how would that work? Yeah. Well, so right here where it says get, if I wanted to go to forward slash about us .html or something, I would just write that there instead. Forward slash about us .html. Unfortunately, my. Uh, my donuts page is not very complicated right now, but if I had multiple pages, yeah, I could hit any page on the website this way. Is there any way that I could buy the other domain so that LDS.org and HTTPS.org go to the same URL? Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that, that's more of a DNS issue, but they're, sit, they're gonna be sitting on the same IP address. Um, so you just make additional DNS entries, say, if, if a query comes in for this domain name, send them to this IP address. And you could register lots of domains. And you would likely, as well, register all the misspellings of your domain name. Um, that used to be like a really big business, too, for shady people. Uh, there are, there's a website called batfingers.com, and, and, <laughs> and, uh, and it, I can't remember what the whole business model around that is, but you can figure out like the, what the most common spellings are of certain things that people type in commonly, and then you try and intercept them. And you can get like, you know, in, in some cases you could get like a, so this is completely different from this topic of conversation that we're having, but just fun business models. Uh, Cause I used to work with, you know, entrepreneurs on the web. So one of the business models is I'm gonna look for websites that are really popular and get a lot of traffic, whether it's eBay or Amazon or whatever, and then I'll type, and then I'll go to Fat Finger and find out like what are the most common misspellings of that, and then suddenly you're getting, you know, a hundred thousand page views a day, even if you just threw like an ad on there, you know, saying, you know, some, some doing ad impressions, like suddenly you're making like thousand dollars a month or something, you're like, yes, <laughs> all I do is just the, the, the churches, Church of Jesus Christ misspellings all go to anti Mormon pages. They do? Yeah. So that would just be bad luck that somebody registered those before. Church got so yeah, like crush of Jesus Christ that org is like they're all on anti Mormon sites. Oh man. You don't mess it up. Okay, and so uh, just kind of as a side note, here's another thing that you could do. Uh, uh, you could install and it, it's not gonna be very big, so you could just do sudo apt-get install links, and this is a text-based web browser that you can install. So we were just doing everything manually. When I say manually, I mean we are literally conforming to the HTTP protocol and writing all the commands in the right order and in the right way. Uh, if we, again, wanna get away from using a web browser, but going a little bit more complicated and using like a and, be, and try to actually browse the web using a web browser that's optimized for the command line, uh, this would be one right here. So after you do sudo apt-get install links, you can do something like linx, and then just type in something like kettles, donuts, or any other place you want to go to on the web, .com. And here we are browsing the web uh, using a command line based editor. So you can install this on any Linux server. So what it does is it doesn't show me the image, it shows me a placeholder for the image, and then it shows the direct text that I had on there. Um, so, let's see, yes, I wanna quit. Let me try the, I'll do links, 
And then my WordPress site is more complicated. So I'll hit do that one. And the way this is set up, I can use my arrows to go up and down because there's actually links on there. So I can click on and, and so I could just select any link and then uh, go there. Let's see. Uh, my story. I hit return. And it made a little comment down here that it was issuing an HTTP 1.0 request or something, and now it basically just filtered the HTML that it got back. So anyway, now you know more about the underbelly of the internet and how, or the, the World Wide Web and how it works. I'll hit Q. Do I want to quit? Yes. So feel free to take a second poking around. Images are sent, but in terms of this web browser for this for uh, this type of window, like it doesn't really make as much sense in that context. Um, you, you you would use something like links if you were just trying to get some content real quick off of a web page, and you weren't interested in looking at pictures. Yeah, this would be horrific for browsing Facebook or something where you actually care about people's pictures. But if you were looking for uh, looking up you know, a tutorial on how to install a driver for your computer or something, yeah, and if it came up with a result, you're like, oh yeah, that's, that's awesome, I just needed that text there. All right, next thing I wanted to show you uh, is seeing again the HTTP headers in Chrome. So let us go, uh, go to one of your Chrome windows or tab. Let's open up the developer tools. Mine I've got opening up on another, on another window. But with that, I'm going to go to some site. Again, I want to go to something simplistic originally with hardly anything on it. So I'll go to Kettle Donuts. All right, there it is. And in this window, which is probably a little bit hard to see, I first click on the network tab, and then where I see the domain name of the place I just visited, I'm going to click on that. And when I do that, hopefully the thing it brings open by default is the headers related to this page visit. And so first it has a little summary here of what was sent in that HTTP request uh, and response, overall what happened. Uh, but then I, I get to see the more specific stuff right after that. So, so here's the response headers. And, well, so let's actually let's go to the, with the request headers first. So we go down to the bottom, and here's all the information that got sent to the web server. And uh, even though it's a little bit tiny, I want to just highlight some things. So it just it just told the web server that I went to that I'm using what browser I'm using what operating system I'm using, et cetera. Uh, all of this stuff gets logged by the web servers you visit, every single one of these requests. And um, if you, depending on how many things you have on there, so let's just say I had 10 images on there and some JavaScript files and stuff like that, every single one of those things on the page, in addition to just the raw HTML page, is gonna generate an additional request which sends this, all of this information over to the web server every single time. And so if I had a web page with 10 images, then there would be 11 requests that got logged on the web server that all have this header information that gets stored. So that's why after the fact I can say, oh, I can see that people are browsing, you know, 50% of my traffic or 80% of my traffic is maybe mobile devices or iPads versus something else. And so this is how I can tell because everybody's sending me, me their headers as they request them. And then, uh, as I go to this upper part, response headers. So this is what I got back from the server. And so the server tells me stuff like, what is the type of server that it's running? What's the operating system that, that it's running? 
Uh, how, it's gonna tell me stuff like how big the file is they're sending me, uh, content encoding. Um, they're saying that in this case that they have compressed the response, that they in essence zipped up the response before they gave it to me, so my web browser needs to unpack it. Actually, so as it relates to that, uh, down here, when my web browser sends a request to a web server, okay, on the one hand, we, we've made it sound pretty simple, because it was simple in the early days. You just make a, a text request and you get back a text response. But nowadays, when we make a request, we're telling the web server a whole bunch of information, like, like, like right there it says accept. It says, I'll, I'll take some text stuff back, I'll take, H, I'll take XHTML, I'll take um, images of various types, um, and usually in here, Oh, here we go. Accept encoding, gzip. So we're telling the web server, hey, if you want to, if you want to, before you send it back to me, if you want to compress it and put it in, a, in, a, in, a, in essence a zipped format, um, I can, I can, I can receive that if you want to send it to me that way. So all kinds of information about what the two parties are able to do gets exchanged in this process. Um, so if you want, take a second right now and just kind of browse around, visit a couple, take, visit a couple websites that you typically like to visit, see if you can tell uh, what, what web servers they're running, what operating systems they're running on, on their servers. So I just visited uh, a BYU domain site, which is dagenkettles.com, and I noticed that in its response headers, that it it shows me it, sh it shows me server, but it doesn't tell me much more than that about um, the server that's giving me information. Why do you, why do you think that is? What would be, what would be potentially be the downside of saying, uh, I'm running Windows Server version version 2019, or I'm running, you know, Linux Debian version X Y Z, and I'm running Apache version X Y Z as well. What could be the downside of sharing that to um, a web ser a, a hosting provider that's serving up, you know, tens of thousands of web websites? What would be the downside of them sharing that information? Would it be like the same issues that Apache is having with Apache Yeah, yeah. So, so right now, things are pretty obscure. I'm like, well, which version of Apache are you running? You haven't told me anything. If, I'm just, if, you, if I've just got some automated crawler visiting every single IP on the internet, like you didn't tell me anything. So now I don't know what to attack. But if they, if they respond back with Apache 2.x or whatever, I'm like, oh, sweet. I'm going to go look at the database of exploits for Apache 2.x. They didn't really tell me much. So, so they're purposely hiding things. Uh, it's a configuration setting that you can set so that uh, people don't know as much about you. So you can shield information optionally. So, oh, did you guys find anything interesting while you were searching? Like, what did you guys find? Yeah. I went to YouTube, and their server says YouTube.com. All right. So, one of the because well, how many servers do you think YouTube has? Just just one. I'm kidding. <laughs> so, so one of the things they do is they. They, they'll use something called a, re one, one thing that you, technique you can use is called a reverse proxy. So you might have a whole bunch of servers of a particular type, could be IIS, could be Apache, could be Nginx, whatever it is, and you can put it behind another server that acts as a load balancer that we, call, we can call a, a reverse proxy. And the reverse proxy will take the request and it'll distribute it among the potential servers on the back end that are listening. 
And one of several functions that that reverse proxy serves is it uh, completely, um, take, it takes away all the information of the servers behind it. So, so it's, in that sense, it's a security feature. So it did two things. One is it distributed the traffic evenly for the incoming traffic, and two, uh, on the way back, it, strip, it can strip out uh, and anonymize like how this stuff got back to you, where it came from, how it was generated. So that's a common thing. Anything else? What else did you find? Any IIS websites or anybody running a Windows server? Or? I guess we probably just go to the same big places all the time, like eBay, Google, YouTube. Did you have off-campus inter internships or, or jobs? Like, what are they running? Can we see? Details about Apache or just Apache? Apache. Okay. So I just did a, inter I, I'm just thinking through this, I just did a default install of Apache, app git install Apache, and then with that, um, that Apache out of, the ball, out of the box is configured to return the information that you just saw, so I'm sure I could go into the configuration files and change that a little bit, but the default then is to expose that information. Any others? Not carrying on. All right, you guys. I think you guys already know the basics about requesting web pages. Um, we indicate a protocol. You type in the the, the domain area. You, you can specify a port on there. Uh, you can technically run a bunch of different websites off of different ports uh, and point them at different folders on the computer, so you could have like the production one, but then you could have just port 8080 going to dev, dev or test one, and 8082 going to staging, and everything could all be sitting on the same computer, but you could, um, uh, just through configuration files, have it redirect the traffic to different places based on the ports that you uh, indicate. Uh, but you guys understand paths and query items because you've been doing a lot of programming, so there's not a lot to be said about that. Uh, again, example of the request, it gets trans, so just from the thing you enter into the browser bar, it takes what you've typed in and it changes into something like this, saying like what kind of stuff your browser will accept on the way back. Um, and again, related to your programming, you're aware of the different types of commands that can be generated. So when you see something like this, in a route within Node or something like that, you're really just talking about something that exists at a, at a lower level in just a text-based language. Your programming language is just initiate like git and, let's see, let's go back, yeah. Git and post requests and stuff like that. that and you could do that yourself programmatically. But when you use a library to do it, you might use these words, but you literally use those words once you break it down to the actual text that gets sent off across the wire. Uh, there's response, all kinds of information there. Some of it we've already talked about. Um, date and time on the server that you're talking to, etc. As an example of one, this is, so this one says Microsoft Office Web Server. Um, ooh, this one came back with a cookie. So if you got a cookie, that would also show up in your header. So if you use your programming language to say set cookie or some equivalent command to that, it's gonna, uh, in the response, it's just gonna append to the header and do something that looks like that. Well, in this case, we see server Microsoft IIS version 5.0. 5, 5 so similar stuff. 
Uh, when things go wrong or right, uh, our protocol, in the, so notice in our responses there, we get an, uh, a status code of 200 okay. Uh, here's our range of statuses that we can be given back. So, so there's a category for these, so anything within these 99, 100, 100 numbers, this means it's an informational response. This is anything in this range is a successful response. Uh, you can get a, a, do a redirect, so your web browser in the response header would, would see a message that begins with uh, 300 and something, and that's gonna mean you're gonna be redirected somewhere else. Uh, in terms of common ones we see all the time, historically, you've either got your success code, and then, so what's, what's 404 typically associated with? Like, file not found. Yeah. And so they're saying, another way of saying this is they're, they're calling it your fault. So if you get a 400 error, they're saying, we think that you did something wrong by requesting something that doesn't exist. Uh, whereas all the time with Microsoft technologies, I seem to see 500 errors, which means server errors. So you can kind of differentiate between did, did you do something wrong or did the server break? And if you're getting a 500 error, there's not gonna be any, probably much you can do until somebody reboots or fix their code. So in some years, I would have people memorize these code ranges and ask them questions but about it on the exams, but not this year. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's, uh, and, and so I've been saying that this is all just text-based stuff that we gener that we can interact with using code if we want to. So here's an example. So if you're just a, in, in any programming, one thing I wanted to highlight to you is you know you might be working in a lot of different programming languages in your life, whether it be Python or Go or JavaScript or C Sharp or Python or PHP, uh, etc. Regardless of what language you're working in, you can just type in something related to how do I do X related to headers, request and response headers, um, and you'll get back some code samples. So this one was like, how do I do an HTTP post? And I think I said with C sharp or something. And so as I scroll down a little bit, it shows me um, a way that I could programmatically make a web request and then get a response as a string. But where it gets interesting here is, as part of my response, I want to add things to the, to the header. So I can add in cookies, I can add in all kinds of things. Um, I can also, I can manipulate this so that the request that I'm sending mimics something that came from a web browser. Why would I want to visit some website and pretend that I'm a web browser even though I'm doing it programmatically? Why do I want to spoof a web browser and trick the server into thinking that I'm using a web browser and not just running code? Um, perhaps. Uh, when, and when I say more information, what I mean is they may only talk to certain clients that they recognize, and they may, they may purposely not want to be talking with just some code or some bot that's crawling the web. So I'll give you an example. Uh, for a website that I was working, or for, yeah, for a website that I was managing once, we wanted to go out to another website and we wanted to scrape uh, at least 100,000 products that they had on there. And there were some complexities with that one of them was that it required that you look like a browser while you're visiting their site. And the other one is you had to log in and you had to get cookied and stuff like that. And so our, our crawling code then had to mimic everything about a web browser, including sending the, sending the initial request, doing a login with a post. And when the response came back and says, here's your cookie, now we saved that and we used the cookie with each of our follow-up requests. So then it just looked, and then, and then to, so that we weren't hitting them like too fast. We put like, you know, a, a half second or a one second sleep before every single page URL we visit 
and then we visit like 100,000 pages and or more and we scrape all the products off of their website. And then as far as their web server logs, it looks like, oh wow, it looks like somebody using Chrome or Firefox visited us 100,000 times. But they're never gonna check their logs or notice. As long as you don't put too much burden on them, you can, you know, you'll never, they'll never care. <laughs> so, anyway, so depending on your job, uh, programming, um, you can program stuff and Uh, one of the last, second to the last things I think that I wanted to mention is uh, HTTP2. So the original, the original model worked, uh, it, it's been effective for us. I think Dr. Albrecht always says, oh, we just make up something and then we use it. Uh, but it doesn't mean that in the long run it's actually the most effective thing to do. So uh, this whole text response thing is, is cool, but one of the downsides to it is, as I was kind of mentioning before, if you visit a web page that has some JavaScript on it, some CSS in it, and 10 images, then every single thing creates a separate request on the server. So if there's the web page plus 13 assets, there's 14 different TCP connections that have to happen to pull things down. So oftentimes what happens is um, you go out there, you request the page, like the piece of paper, you get it back and then you initiate 13 more calls in succession to get everything back. And that's not necessarily the most efficient way to do things. And so HTTP2, one of the things it does is it creates a, a push model. So when you go and you make that initial request, the server starts automatically sending all those stuff to you that you're gonna be requesting. So, uh, so it is an enhancement. I believe Volt, it, it was created by uh, Google as a way to more effectively transfer things along. So, if your server is enabled that way and your browser is enabled that way, you can have uh, faster downloads happening. Oh, there's much more to say about that. It doesn't affect us terribly because we can still write the same stuff on our web servers and stuff, but just know that um, people that are doing some of the lower level details are making it work faster all the time. So we could watch a six minute video to explain why it is said in like 60 seconds, but man. Okay, uh, in terms of web server market share, uh, so back in the day, you know, starting around, you know, 96, we can see with the blue line that Apache just kind of came out, free web server, you can install it on Linux, which is also free, and so it just, for the most part, dominated the market, and Microsoft and Red was always competing. Now, the interesting thing is that you know, to run IIS, you have to be, so, so the, really the competition here is between, you know, doing proprietary paid licensing and servers versus free servers and software. Uh, and so it, it kind of raises a question like, why in the world are there people, you know, are, you know, 30% of the world's websites running on an IIS server that you have to pay money uh, to use? And just historically for me living in that space, it's interesting that, uh, so, so if you go to the, sorry, I'll, I'll back up a second here. This, this comes from the site Netcraft, so at any point in your life, you can just type in Netcraft web server survey, and it'll give a report of what's happened that's driving the changes. And so some of the things that Microsoft would do at any given time is they would go out and buy some, some company that has maybe 10 million websites that are parked but not being used, so the domain names are registered, but they're not actually being used for anything. So Microsoft, in order to boost their numbers, since they have billions and billions of cash they're sitting on, they'll go out to people, you know, organizations that have web domains parked and say, hey, we want to pay for those domains to be, instead of parked on Linux, we will pay you a million dollars or whatever to instead just park them on an IIS server instead. So in terms of corporate titans battling it out, one of the ways that they, you know, change their public perception is, um, is by buying, <laughs> buying servers and, and, and websites and putting them onto their stuff, even if they're not being used. Um, but anyway, so for the longest time, you know, the, the big fight was between uh, free Apache and Microsoft IIS that you have to pay for. And then you can see over here in green uh, what's happened in just the last year, year and a half, two years. Who's your daddy now? <laughs> Nginx. So, any ideas why Nginx is suddenly 
beat these folks? Well, in, 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 in part, in part, you know, they, they came up with something that worked. Doesn't mean it was necessarily the most efficient. They came up with something that worked. And then uh, the way that Nginx was built, it just, it just is uh, more efficient in terms of serving up web requests. For, in, order, in, a, in other words, squeezing the maximum amount of web servers, uh, serving pages, or, uh, how do I say that? <laughs> in terms of squeezing the most out of your hardware for serving up web pages, you know, some Russian guy came up with a better way to do it. And so now everybody just says, hey, let's use that one. It's also free. So, I mean, why use something slower if you don't have to, right? So, anyway, they built a better mousetrap, so, and it's free, so use it. Uh, so some stuff about Apache, because it's really old, lots of good security, flexibility, stuff you can do with it. Um, Microsoft, it is easy to use and integrated um, with other Microsoft products. Nginx, fast. Better architecture for how it serves up stuff. Okay, so that's, that's, that's all web stuff. Um, anything else you want to know related to that? Not, we've got 17 minutes and I've got email stuff. I'm not as re I'm, I'm semi ready to go with the email stuff, but I'm not as ready to go with the email stuff. It'll still be kind of good. Uh, but, all right, so if you're not running for the door, then I'll give you some email stuff. All right. So typically when we teach this class, we'll have, you know, like a, you know, a four or four data communications type class at any university. We'll have like at least a day on web servers. We'll have at least a day on DNS. We'll have at least a day on uh, email. So this would kind of fill in that topic for as far as we get. <laughs> all right, if you were taking a test, all of these words up here would be meaningful to you. But since you're not gonna be taking a test on anything related to email, um, then you don't have to worry about it. We're just learning a little bit more about email in case it comes up later on in our life. Okay, so just to kind of base it and practice a little bit, uh, let's just say that you, on your Raspberry Pi, for example, you install WordPress or you install WordPress in some other environment, and one of the features it has in there in a bunch of different places for administrative reasons is it can send out emails. But nobody's getting any emails with this default configuration. Anybody know why? Why is it that we just install some software on a Linux server anywhere in this world? It doesn't have to be WordPress. Anything that's meant to send out email. Why is it that just send, you know, installing something on there that has an email function built into the software, why is it that out of the box that the email function send is going gonna, is gonna to fail? This is a trick question, Dr. Kettles. <laughs> we don't know the answer. Why are you asking me this? <laughs> Maybe it doesn't have any addresses of people to be posted? No, no. Let's just say, right in WordPress, you say send it to the admin email address, Christopher McLeod at, at gmail.com. Why, why does it not go? <laughs> the mail function runs on the Linux server and then it just like, disappears. Why didn't it go anywhere? It has to do with, with how email works. You have to have, an kind of like a post office or something, you have to have an authorized um, sending service to send it through. That would probably be the easiest way to say it. Until you configure that, and, it, and, and when you do use an authorized sending service, um, it needs to recognize you as the sender. It used to be that there were um, that there were that were servers out there that you could just we would call them just like open mail servers and you open SMTP servers, uh, and anybody in the world could just find the IP address of that server and everybody in the world could send through it, and then every spammer in the world totally abused that. You know, so somebody's over in Russia or wherever else, and they're like, sweet, I found an open SMTP server. 
one million emails a day going to that IP address. So, so all of the resources. So there's actually a cost to running that stuff, and it annoys people as well when you're the if you're the SMTP server, if you're the source of spam. So anyway, all right. So I'm going to show you uh, an I'm going to show you a video of somebody explaining how mail works. And good news, bad news. Um, bad news is it's a little boring. Good news is it's, it makes me look really good to like show other instructors that are that dry. So, anyway. <laughs> it's still useful information though. I usually use this as a setup to. Want to talk about um, sending and receiving mail on the internet, and I want to cover two scenarios. I want to cover sending and receiving <coughs> using a standard email client, desktop-based client like Outlook, Outlook Express, and using a web-based client, i.e., a web browser. So let's start with an email client, and we have. Someone sitting at his PC, his laptop, and composes his email. Once he's composed his email, he connects his client to his internet service email provider, whatever provider that is, and he sends that email using a protocol called SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. So the email is sent from his client machine to the email server here. This server is located on the 